But I think right now it seems like uh, the there's a right mix of builders who want to experiment and sort of like momentum, energy, attention. And I think those things are actually very important uh, for things to take off. So I, I look at BRC journey. Thanks for tuning into Stacker Chats. I'm Gina Abrams, and I'm joined by Muni Bali, Stacks founder. Stacks is a Bitcoin L2, and in these chats, we connect on recent happenings on Bitcoin and Bitcoin layers. So there have been some exciting developments and experimentation recently on Bitcoin, and we've seen a lot of traction for ordinals and BRC20s on the rise. Can you share a little bit more about some of these recent experiments, particularly BRC20s, um, you know, what they are and sort of how they impact the Bitcoin economy and Bitcoin future. Yeah, so I think uh, to me, this is this is super interesting because um, on these uh, talks and otherwise, like on, on, on Twitter spaces and podcasts, I've mentioned the year like 2017 a bunch of times. And I do think it was a pretty interesting year because that's the year where Bitcoin sort of like decided to uh, sort of like close down. Uh, to builders, to ideas because of the block size wars and whatnot. And it's the same year when Ethereum started to take off. Right? Like it was it was embracing experimentation, developers, and started hitting some scalability issues and so on. So if you look at and if you look at 2023, like this year, as a revival of Bitcoin builders, there's a very interesting sort of like analogy that 2017, the sort of like first year of when um, you know Ethereum uh use cases are trying to take off. What were the initial use cases? I think they were sort of like twice, right? Like there was CryptoKitties, which were NFTs, and it was a bunch of meme coins. And uh, these are these are the ERC20 tokens. And very interestingly, if you look at this year on Bitcoin L1, uh, we are seeing uh, inscriptions through ordinals, which are NFTs. And obviously they are much more mature than, than what we saw on, on Ethereum back then. There are a lot of like really high quality projects, really things that you know I would, I would wanna own, for example. And then now we are starting to see uh, token standards. And by the way, again, these things are not new to Bitcoin. Colored coins have existed way in the back. So from a purely technical perspective, like you could have done it before, uh, uh, like with with inscriptions and you know taproot, uh, obviously you have like more data, better compression, and things like that. And Ordinals is a very interesting standard. So I I don't want to uh, sort of like de-emphasize their importance. I think they're very important. But the ideas were sort of there. The the bare bones technical ability was there. But I think right now it seems like uh, the there's a right mix of builders who want to experiment. And sort of like momentum, energy, attention. And I think those things are actually very important uh, for things to take off. So I, I look at BRC20 as a experiment for um, sort of like fungible tokens, right? So NFTs are not non-fungible. Like one NFT is different from the other. Uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin is a fungible asset, but there can be other fungible assets as well. And 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 this is a standard for defining them, right? And, and so this is the one that's sort of like getting more traction, but these things are very, very recent. Uh, there are a bunch of other standards coming up, right? Like I, I believe there are actually two different BR, uh, BRC attorneys. One is from the Ordinal standard, one is from a different project. And then the, the Stamps uh, uh, project, which is sort of like a, a different way of doing NFTs than Ordinals, they have their own uh, uh, standard SRC20 coming out like uh, a couple of days ago. People are already forking the BRC20 standard and kind of like saying we'll make things that are backwards compatible with it and um, and and sort of like try to improve on it. When I'm looking at all of this, what I'm sort of like seeing is early signs of experimentation, which I just think is extremely healthy, right? It's extremely healthy. Uh, Bitcoin fees are going up. I know it, it might feel painful to people who are maybe trying to close their lightning channels or uh, they're trying to consolidate their UTXOs, but believe me, high fees are extremely healthy for Bitcoin in the long run. Like the 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 biggest sort of like you know question mark around security of Bitcoin, like ten years from now, fifteen years from now, is that how are you going to pay for the security budget when the Coinbase rewards go down? So I think if we can show today that uh, like gas fee markets are real, and then similarly. 
it, it sort of like points the the Bitcoin community uh, clearly in the direction of layers, which is in my mind sort of like the only way scalability happens, right? So, so BRC twenty and assets, I think they, they, they whatever standard ends up winning, if it's if it's BRC twenty something else. I do think it's going to be important because even in a world where most of the transactions are happening on L2s, like like uh, or most of the functionality lives on L2s, assets trading is happening on L2s. I do think there's a world where people might want to define their assets primarily on the L1. So for example, uh, with the SBDC work, you can actually uh, peg in uh, your, your Bitcoin from L1 to the stacks L2. And, and then bring it back. Uh, these these some some of these assets that are being defined they're owned by Satoshi's, right? So you can uh, theoretically just peg these in, uh, take it to a proper dex that in a programmable layer, programmable L2 on on Bitcoin, and then uh, basically have all of the functionality there. But in terms of asset ownership, when you're done doing whatever you wanted to do, you can bring things back to L1 and own own something on a hardware wallet. And I think that's a that's a very interesting model where Bitcoin is the ultimate ownership layer, ultimate settlement layer, but that doesn't mean that uh, you have to build all the functionality there. But with that said, I do think initially, like again, going back to the Ethereum model, Ethereum had programmability at the L1. Uh, I think people are coming up with interesting ways to even have basic trading or basic uh, sorts of other functionality at the L1. And I think that's encouraging to see. Like, I think they should do that. They should push the edges and limits of whatever is possible on the L1. But in my mind, all roads in terms of scalability and where this is going in the future would eventually sort of like, uh, they point towards Bitcoin L2s. And if anything, uh, you know, faster experimentation and faster increase in gas fees on the L1 would basically push the uh, the community and the ecosystem towards figuring out the L2 solutions faster. And I think I think, I think that's overall a very, very healthy, healthy thing for the ecosystem. Great, thank you. Now, the Stacks layer has actually experienced some hard forks lately. Can you share an overview of the recent events and what that essentially means for the Stacks Bitcoin layer? Yes, so um, I'll give a quick summary of, of sort of like recently what happened. Uh, so there was an upgrade for the core uh, POX contract. So POX is the contract where people lock their STX to earn the Bitcoin rewards. And there have been many sort of like improvements uh, proposed to it, which went live with Stacks 2.1. That was great to see. And I think uh, in a couple of cycles, I think we believe maybe it was the the the, the second cycle or, or something like that after POX was live, uh, there was a user uh, that sort of like triggered a Stack increase call, uh, and nobody had done that before. And and interestingly, uh, that discovered a potential bug. Uh, not potential, but a real actual bug in the POX2 contract. And interest, and so the, in a way, like I think this was a uh, this was a good sort of like you know the uh, a test for the contract. Uh, and I think it is it's good that it was caught early. It got triggered early, and uh, the ecosystem sort of like came together. It's a very decentralized ecosystem, right? So if something like this happens, you can imagine the first thing is like, hey, who's who do you even talk to? Who's going to do what? And I think the various uh, uh, sort of like governance mechanisms or, or proposals or SIPs that are around, uh, like it was good to see that that system kicked in and people were sort of like able to come together very quickly, evaluate a bunch of different uh, paths forward. And the path that was sort of like the cleanest was that, uh, you know, let's effectively unlock uh, all of the STX that are locked in POX. And, and, and try to sort of like fix the bug uh, and do that uh, rather quickly, right? Because now you're running against a timeline because the, the next cycle is starting and you basically want to do that uh, before the start of the next cycle. And whenever you try to do something very quickly, that's why I think with, with the, these blockchain systems and, and L2s and, and, and so on, you have to be very careful whenever you're making any consensus level changes. And that's exactly what happened where because you're trying to move very fast, uh, there was a side effect of uh, uh, where you know some of the existing applications like Gamma or Alex and Arcadico they got impacted uh, by the upgrade that was supposed to fix the POX thing, right? And then, then you quickly within 24 hours 
uh, basically submitted a hot fix for that. And I, I do think uh, on the on one side, you know, the the stacks layer has been in mainnet for almost two years, and this is really the sort of like the first time uh, that these rapid hot fixes at the consensus level, one after the other, um, had to be uh, had to be pushed out. Like like Pux one ran for almost two years with no bugs really, and this was this was the the new upgrade in which uh, uh, we, we we saw an issue. So I think obviously. Uh, that means there's room for improvement. That means uh, there needs to be better test coverage, maybe in the open source ecosystem, more test engineers, uh, better frameworks for you know running these tests more rapidly, more thoroughly, and so on. I think obviously those learnings, people are taking them home and taking taking it very seriously. Again, I only speak for my entity trust machines that has a business interest mostly on the SPDC side of things, but we are we are we are we are sort of like you know. Uh, uh, watching uh, this ecosystem and, and are friendly with a lot of other players here. And, and uh, even if we don't directly do that work, uh, we are seeing that people are obviously taking uh, some of those lessons like very, very seriously. Uh, but on the flip side, uh, I've, I've been with this project since day one, you know, one silver lining here and, 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 and uh, in some ways as a, a show of strength that I've seen is that the ecosystem is maturing where within 24 hours, like imagine this is an actual decentralized ecosystem, like several independent entities, independent players, governance bodies, these different SIP committees and CABs and so on. Within 24 hours, a new SIP is written, it's debated, uh, it's approved. A lot of the builders were impacted. They're coming in, they're chiming in, they're even becoming co-authors of, of the SIP. Um, and then there is an implementation. This is within 24 hours. There is an implementation that fixes the issue, and new release I think goes live, and very rapidly. I think there was a very short time frame uh, that was selected by the SIP for even the miners and exchanges to upgrade. And all of that happened. I believe I, I don't want to get this wrong, but I believe within 48 hours, um, and the new release is live. So I think that there is. Um, a silver lining here that the ecosystem is maturing. We're figuring out how to work with each other in a decentralized ecosystem, in a decentralized way. When everyone's interest is aligned, I think earlier what would happen is everybody would want something, but it's there's a tragedy of the com commons, right? Like nobody's taking initiative. Nobody's sort of like saying, hey, let's do this. And I think now people are realizing that there's no central company that's going to do this. Uh, if you want something, you really have to be proactive and you have to play your role. And then after uh, sort of like interacting with each other for a while, people are sort of like understanding what their role is, right? So uh, if you're an app developer, you understand that, look, if something matters to me, I, I will have to step up. I'll have to really participate at the at the SIP discussions level, co-author something, uh, talk talk to the developers and, and, and try to communicate like how important something it is to you and so on and so forth. So I, I do think that in some ways it was it was actually like a good uh, test of a system that you can respond to something critical in in uh, in a very professional way in a, in, a, in a very short time frame and that was that was great to see. Absolutely, thank you. Now you mentioned that obviously folks are taking lessons. Um, are there any sort of action items or follow ups that you're tracking um, related to improving this process and generally? Yeah, I think I think there's some low hanging fruit. Like, like for example, there's the concept of test coverage, um, and the 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 the, the blockchain code uh, should have like a 100% test coverage. And I, I do think you can get there. I I, I don't think we're we're there yet, but that's that's one thing. Uh, same with resources. Like if you look at the various open source contributors and developers, I do think that dedicated test en engineers um, are. Like, like relatively, there aren't a lot of them uh, who are contributing, right? So that is something for the ecosystem to figure out, either various entities that have a business uh, in, kind of like incentive to contribute to the code, either they step up or there are various grants processes or open source contributors who can who can help. But I think that that need is like very clearly sort of like identified. Uh, the other thing that, that also came up uh, recently is that um, because you know, decentralization can also mean like, you know, ambiguity and because people don't know, uh, you know, even if you want to contribute, like which which repository, which team, which issues should I be working on? So recently there has been more focus on um, basically folks 
who can help organize the open source project a little bit better, uh, uh, have like better sort of like, you know, roadmaps, better uh, design docs, and especially for new engineers who come in, uh, better architecture, sort of like high level descriptions, but that, that, that are linked to actual open issues on, on the project. That if you really want to contribute, here's something you can do. And by the way, here's how it connects to the bigger picture. Right. So I think that thing is not very clear today. Like people who are deep in the pool, who are very kind of like involved, they, they have a better idea. But if you're a new engineer, new open source contributor, new startup that is kind of like using this tax L2 and wants to help, uh, it, it's unclear exactly how, how you can do that. So more improvements to, uh, towards it can actually go a long way. And that's totally normal, right? Like if you look at any open source project that became uh, popular and lots of devs started uh, contributing to it, I think they go through this phase of, of, of maturing. And I think we're at a very interesting place where earlier, uh, if somebody would have asked like, uh, hey, what's the thing the, the SACS open source project is lacking right now? I, I'd keep saying like, you know, developers who know Rust or developers who know consensus or, or backend systems. I think for the first time I'm feeling that people who uh, can be like, you know, uh, TPMs are generally good at organizing open source projects. Uh, they can come in and actually uh, maybe maybe that's the bottleneck right now, right? And, and so it's a the, the bottleneck has sort of shifted, but I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, we'll we'll find some great people uh, who can contribute. And again, by we I mean the ecosystem, uh, not not kind of like my uh, my company.